Hello, I'm Douglas Schatz, host of the Play Podcast. When we recorded episode three on Samuel Beckett's Endgame, Matt and I talked for longer than our allotted hour. On listening back to our conversation, I thought that it was a shame that we had to edit out a section of our conversation that talked about Beckett's early life, as well as where his first plays came from, including, of course, his breakthrough play, Waiting for Godot, which had a controversial reception when it premiered in 1953, but also established Beckett as a dramatist of world renown. So here is that extra bit of our recording. Please forgive the abrupt intro and end to the excerpt, as we have clipped it out of the flow of our longer conversation. Matt would also like to correct a point of fact by confirming that Beckett died in December 1989 rather than 1988, as he initially said in the recording. Yes. Now, I want to go back to the beginning. We talked about you. I'm really amazed that you came from the, and obviously it makes sense, you came from the same places that Beckett and Wilde, you mentioned even, um, came from. So I wonder if you could share with us a little bit, Matt, about Beckett's own life and how he came to write these plays in particular. But, you know, he was, he was obviously Irish, but he didn't live in Ireland for most of his life, did he? No, so I'll try and give you a sort of very succinct whistle-stop tour of <laughs> Beckett's life. So he was born on Good Friday, Friday the 13th, if that's somewhat yeah. honest. Um, so the 13th of April, 1906. And of course, he was born in Ireland. But he did die, um, I should just say, to, be, to round that off, um, on the 22nd of December, 1988. Beckett grew up in Ireland. He spent his formative years around the Fox Rock area, which is quite a well-to-do part of Dublin. Um, if you ever get a chance to visit Fox Rock, you can even see that today. That's uh, a, but, I, that was one of the things I found amazing was to discover that he, he grew up in a you know, comfortable middle-class family. His house was large enough to have a tennis court in the garden. And you mentioned playing football earlier. I thought that was also fascinating because he was apparently a natural sportsman, right? He was a cricketer of some quality and all of that yes. all of that found i found that really strange because you have this idea based on, on nothing much i had this idea based on his the landscape of his plays and those famous photos of him with his exceptionally spare f- physical um, appearance that he must have been some sort of ascetic he you know so even just having some idea that he had a real life some you know a comfortable potentially happy life childhood seems incongruous Definitely. So he went to school in Dublin, first of all, at Earl's Sport, Earl Sport House, and then went up to Pretoria Royal School in Enniskillen, which then, what's interesting about Beckett's relationship with Enniskillen is that he would have been going there whenever the, the island of Ireland was fractured. So partition was coming into play right. in that respect. And Beckett would have been getting the train from Dublin to Enniskillen and going through the border. But when he was in Enniskillen, he was a prolific sportsman, as you highlight. Um, so he was involved in the cricket team. He was involved in the rugby team and referred to as being as bold as a lion behind the scrum. And the rugby team were quite impressive. They got to the equivalent of the um, English schools final, the Ulster schools final, um, which is quite impressive. They did get quite heavily thumped though. Um, he also was involved in boxing as well within the, wow. the school. Okay. After Pretoria, he then went to Trinity College in Dublin where he studied modern languages. And then he sort of had a, a few years of, how, how would I say, wandering, if you like. Um, he was perhaps wondering what his future would hold, what career he might undertake. I think his father was very keen for him to work in the Guinness storehouse, for example. Okay. Um, but Beckett, um, Beckett tried to be a teaching assistant for a number of years. He also taught his own classes at Campbell College in Belfast. He w- went to France, he went to Dublin on this sort of circuit of teaching. And then he started trying to evolve his own uh, writing style and his career as a writer. Um, so in the sort of mid thirties, he was moving across France and Germany at this particular point and writing some of his early novels, such as Murphy, Dream Affair to Living Women. And then of course, World War II happened um, mm-hmm. and Beckett, decided famously that he would rather stay in France than neutral Ireland. Right. So he joined the French resistance 
and moved from Paris right down to the south of France and spent a number of years in Roussillon, which is quite a famous part of Beckett's biography. And indeed is where the grape vines of the Bonnelly vineyard appear in Gado, arguably. That's right. the French version, not the English version. Uh, after World War II, in that sort of became perhaps the most important part of um, Beckett's career as a writer. It sort of uh, enabled this flurry of writing, if you like. Yeah, so, so he was he was uh, interesting that he was he was a linguist, right? He did languages at Trinity, so you know he was able to settle in Europe. And and what struck me as well was that, as you're saying, did after the war he came to start writing plays. But he was writing in French ori originally. These these plays, Waiting for Godot and Endgame, were written initially in French, correct? Correct, yeah. So, En attendant Godot and um, Fin de Partie are the French titles, but they were translated quickly after. I should also clarify that, yes, he did write the trilogy of novels, but he did also write Eleutheria, which remains an unperformed Beckett play. Ah. I'm sure somebody out there has... Um, eyeing up the potential of staging that for the very first time. Why is it unperformed? Uh, that was at Beckett's request, though I do understand some rehearsed readings have taken place and some performances have maybe taken place behind closed doors. Okay. So how did he come to write plays? Because as you're saying, he was writing novels and essays and things, I think, before this time after the war. Did, what did he think of the theatre? Why did he write for the theatre at this point? He famously said that writing for the theater became a recreation from the prose. Okay. So it became a sort of way of him unwinding in many respects. Whenever he started writing plays, he did write Eleutheria. He did also write Godot around about the same time, a couple of years apart. Um, but Eleutheria was a lot less producible than Godot. Mm -hmm. I think Eleutheria has maybe 17 characters. I can't, can't, can't quite remember but over 130 pages of dialogue as well. And it's, it's almost unstageable in some respects because of the, the heavy furniture and the heavy setting that's involved. In contrast to that, Godot has five characters, six yeah. if you count Godot, of course, um, and a, ver a very minimal setting as well. So inevitably that became a lot more of an attractive option to producers in France when he was First trying to get it, was it, still, it was still quite hard to get off the ground, as I understand. But um, and that, is that partly because of what he was doing was so different? Did people look at this and go, what, what is this? I don't understand this. And when he was trying to Incredibly launch hard. these? Um, I think a number, of, a number of his friends, a number of theatre people did see, definitely did see the merit in Godot. But... At that time in the French theatre, theatres were very much looking for a hit. They were looking for something that would be financially successful. And that mm -hmm. was very much the case in British theatre and English theatre at the time as well. So it took a lot of convincing for French theatres to finally produce it. And when it was finally staged at the Théâtre de Babylon in 1953, that was because of a substantial grant that they received from the, the French government. Okay. So what was the um, what was the reaction to Gado when it when it first came out? As, I mean, I don't I don't think the preliminary the audiences initially really got it, did they? There was didn't there stories of people getting up and outraged at the interval and leaving and things like that. Yeah, I think whatever theater culture you, you decide to hone in on, I think the reactions were quite stark. Obviously, there are quite a number of walkouts that happened. There are quite a number of cat calls across the performances. If we think of the very first London production that happened, yeah, um, Arts Theatre, which was directed by Peter Hall in 1955, um, that nearly closed after the first couple of days. The reviews in the sort of daily newspapers were really negative, but it was actually the weekend papers that saved Godot and perhaps arguably see if Beckett's reputation and the, right. Longe, the writer and um, so he was supported there particularly by Harold Hobson and Kenneth Tynan right and Tynan's review in particular stressed the sort of originality of, of Beckett's work he called himself a Godardista and um, he said that the play forced him to re-examine the rules which he um, engaged with in terms of the theatre as well so that was yes. really important 
Yeah, it's really interesting about, um, because I was trying to, I'm doing a bit of research about what Beckett thought of the theater and what he was, what, as we said, where did this come from, what he was trying to do. And there was a quote from him saying, all theater is waiting. And uh, obviously that seems to ring a bell with the plays. Um, but uh, I wonder about that in a way, you know, in conventional drama, our expectation is that something's going to happen during this course of this play that will profoundly affect the characters' circumstances and their view of themselves in the world. That's the conventional structure of thesis, antithesis, synthesis, based on the characters' um, objectives and the obstacles they face, um, and that there's maybe a turning point and ultimately leads to resolution. But you know, does he completely abandon all these conventions? Is that what Tynan was trying to say, that, that these, this is a new form? of those things or is that is that actually still there in the that sort of conventional structure certainly a new form but i think it's worth noting what london theater audiences at that time were used to so they were used to farces they were used to drawing room dramas they were used to musicals and something as obscure and perhaps as radical as Godot, with a very naked stage um, was something that audiences and, and indeed actors weren't used to at that particular time. You've got to bear in mind that the audiences were going partly for the spectacle as well. So having very little furniture or very little props to sort of relate to or connect to was difficult for audiences. Yeah, it's interesting. That's said, still, that's that. still, yeah, sorry to talk over you. That still applies to some degree now. People go, you know, to the West End for the big musicals. And also I would, when we did our, Episodes on Ibsen, for example, when he first, first, his first plays, late plays first came, tried to come to London. You know, again, the conventions there were French melodrama and various things. And so actually even just seeing someone's real life drawing room and of course the um, much more realistic and uh, challenging stories of the people who inhabit those real life drawing rooms in Ibsen was a big change and was not initially welcome at all either. So, I, you know, it's interesting how there are cycles of that in theater anyway. It still goes on. Um, I'm sure Sarah Kane was not to everybody's taste initially either. Uh, it was interesting that one of the critics about Gatto said, that, that I love this line, that he has achieved a theoretical impossibility, a play in which nothing happens that yet keeps audiences glued to their seats. What's more, since the second act is a subtly different reprise of the first, he has written a play in which nothing happens twice. Um, yeah, that's the famous Vivian Mercier quote. Right. Um, from the Irish Times. Yeah, Slightly glib. That, 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 that quote, in many respects, has sort of followed the play everywhere it's gone as well. Um, you look but, a little bit disparaging about that. Is that... No, it's, it's, it's a wonderfully witty quote. Um, brilliant. I wish I could have thought of it. Um, yeah. I wish that had been around to... Right about it at the time. So Gatto had this initially maybe difficult start, but then actually rocketed to uh, public attention and, and acclaim and popularity. And he became overnight in a way, I guess, uh, a name in the theater. <laughs> If you still haven't had enough of Beckett and Endgame, you can read more in our ragbag selection of footnotes to the episode on our website at www.theplaypodcast.com. Our footnotes include brief notes on such subjects as Beckett's love of chess, his relationship with James Joyce, and what he really thought of the British censor, the Lord Chamberlain. Thanks for listening.